Great to have you with us. We begin with breaking news tonight on the Don the Report. The Senate expected to vote tonight on the business vaccine mandate laid out by the Biden administration. Could they strike it down and what would that mean? Kelly Meyer live from the Russell Rotunda on Capitol Hill for us tonight. Kelly, let's start with the timing on all of this. I guess we were expecting a vote about a half an hour ago. What's the latest? Yeah, that's right. We are still waiting here to see what happens. There is expected to be a bipartisan showing against the president's vaccine mandate. Two Democrats, Montana Senator John Tester and West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, may vote with Republicans to overturn the federal mandate, showing while they do support getting vaccinated, they don't support the federal government telling you to get it. Republicans, we heard from today, calling it a federal overreach and a threat to public safety. Democratic leadership calling it an anti-vaccine proposal that would take away critical tools that could help end the pandemic. Here's Senator Braun. We talked with him just moments ago. This is a tool to point out politically how bad it is. There have got to be 25 or 30 Democratic House seats that are in places that they're hearing the same thing that I'm hearing back in Indiana. And that's at 86. And that's Republican Senator Mike Braun from Indiana. He and other Republicans, along with some Democrats, argue this is also putting an added strain on businesses where some business owners say vaccines are a personal choice. Joe. Kelly, what are you hearing about why Congress did this, why the Senate did this? Because the courts in several instances have already shot this down. They're saying it sends a message to the president that there is direct bipartisan opposition to the vaccine mandate. That's still unclear if the measure will have enough votes to pass in the House. If it does, it then goes to the president's desk where he is almost certain to veto it. Sure. The lawmakers here tell me that shows the president is going against a bipartisan majority here in Congress. Joe? All right, we will see what happens, but let us know, Kelly Meyer, if anything pops in the next uh, hour, we'll certainly bring it along. Thank you. For more insight on this now, I want to welcome in a uh, political reporter, our friend from our partners at The Hill, Julia Manchester. Julia, so I guess if this vote goes down as expected, as we heard from Kelly there, does this mean uh, this is the end of mandate talk? I mean, essentially, as we said, it's been shot down in the courts. Now it's dead in the Senate, it appears anyway. Is this mandate talk over? Well, it'll essentially go to Joe Biden's desk uh, at some point if it passes through the Senate. And we know that uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer has said he intends it to go through the Senate. And if it goes uh, through the Senate, it'll go to Biden's desk. And he is uh, very much likely to pass. If it doesn't, uh, if it doesn't get through both chambers, he will likely override it. So, you know, I think ultimately it doesn't necessarily matter what the next step is. I think ultimately this is a political football game ahead of the midterms. You know, I think Republicans are smart to lay this out on the table and get some Democratic voices. Look, we have seen a number of Democratic governors, including Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer, for example, uh, become a little more soft on the vaccine mandate, say, you know, they're, they're for it in situations where it's for healthcare workers or federal workers. However, for businesses, that's a whole other ball game. And we're seeing a lot of polling that would suggest there's sort of a growing, um, you know, people have growing issues with the vaccine mandate. So politically, it seems like it's becoming more unpopular for President Biden. This is different, Julia, than the, the threat to shut the government down, right? I mean, essentially, it's separate, but what Republicans wanted last week when we were talking about this. Yeah, I mean, this is Republicans very much sending a message that, you know, they say, look, uh, there are Democrats that disagree with the idea of a vaccine mandate for businesses, and there are a growing number of Americans that disagree with vaccine mandates for private businesses. Right. You know, this is coming just, you know, 11 months before the midterm elections. They want to be able to have a lot of these Democratic representatives and senators on the record as voting for this. And I would say that I would predict that Republicans would somehow try to use that against them. So we don't know how much of an issue this will be going forward. But as we enter this 20, 2022, which is expected by some medical experts to be a bit of a transition year out of COVID or potentially entering a new stage of life within the coronavirus pandemic, I think we're going to see new opinions emerge on these issues of vaccine mandates. Right. All right. We'll see. Because this does. It impacts the uh, mandate for businesses, Julia, just to be clear here, the federal mandate yes. for workers, the military stands and businesses that want to enforce a mandate can still do uh, just that. But we will continue to follow tonight. Julia, thanks for the info. Appreciate it. Thank you. Now, this is a shot in the arm. 
Pfizer and BioNTech announcing a booster shot of their vaccine in a lab study does protect against the new Omicron variant, but you need three shots. And GlaxoSmithKline saying its drug treatment for COVID patients in initial tests is also working against Omicron. And the White House's top COVID doctor, Anthony Fauci, saying in a media interview, Omicron is almost certainly not more severe than Delta. This, while the total number of reported deaths from Omicron worldwide remains at zero. But as we see new variants appear, vaccine scientists, according to Politico, are telling the White House you need a new Operation Warp Speed, the initiative that helped develop the first round of vaccines. So how would that look and how would it work? Who better to ask than Adam Bowler? He was a founding member of Operation Warp Speed under President Trump. And Dr. Brett Joao back with us again, the former White House testing czar. So, gentlemen, a lot of good news here. Dr. Joao, let's start with you. From the treatment to what the news has come now, about 200 million Americans fully vaccinated and the latest from Pfizer and how effective the vaccine against Omicron. What do we know about the other vaccines at this point? Well, right now we don't know about the other vaccines, but we would suspect similar results to the Pfizer vaccine. And again, all we have is the press release, but it's very encouraging is that the booster of the Pfizer uh, vaccine, at least in a test tube, looks like it gives equivalent protection against Omicron as two doses would against the other strains of, of uh, coronavirus, of COVID-19. So this is very good news. We also expect uh, that other treatments would be uh, successful as well. Um, not all monoclonal antibodies, but uh, some mm -hmm. of the monoclonal antibodies seem to be helpful. And remember that oral drug from Merck and Ridgeback that we're right. waiting for authorization, it should work against all variants as well. Uh, Adam, when, when the, uh, the Omicron news broke uh, over Black Friday, it was sort of a slow weekend of news and everyone kind of panicked, at least for the weekend, right? I mean, the, the markets dropped, we shut down international flights, but the American people seemed in the end to kind of shrug it off. And now, as we know, it doesn't appear to be as serious. Is this what we're in for as these variants continue to, uh, I guess, arise? Is this kind of like a rinse and repeat, do you think? I mean, I think it's a little bit of the, you see the development of diseases like this. And we're going to come to a point where, look, you get your flu shot, you're going to be getting your COVID booster every year. So I think it's going to be coming to a point of normalization at some point. And then the question is going to become, how do we avoid another pandemic? Because COVID-19 and, and everything that will go on will eventually become a regular part of life in terms of how we deal with it. What's the next and what's the next and how do we prepare for that? So I guess the concern with that then, doctor, would be that there is some variant that finds a way to outrun the virus. Well, it, it's always certainly possible uh, because viruses do evolve and we have to do our best to, uh, to work against that. And again, the vaccines we have now have been remarkably effective against mm -hmm. all the variants. And I just want to define what effective is. If I get the sniffles for two days and no long-term side effects, that's not a vaccine failure. That's a vaccine success. And we're seeing that across the board. And remember, our oral drugs from Merck and from Pfizer that we expect to be authorized will work against all of them. And I agree with Adam, um, and I often do, that this will be a normal part of our lives. I don't think we're going to have to have vaccines every year, but it's certainly possible. Mm. But it will smolder. It just won't be as significant with hospitalizations and deaths, and certainly not the number of cases. Yeah, my question as I got my booster was, are we going to have to do this every six months? But I guess to you guys, it sounds like every year. Adam, let me get you on this new call for a new Operation Warp Speed. There are experts saying this is the most important important project we can undertake. And also, we need a universal coronavirus vaccine that's not affected by variants. We can do it, but we need the will. Um, do you think we can do it, and do we have the will? I mean, we did it once before. Um, and I think at the end of the day, and this is something that I work really closely with Admiral Giroir on and, and the whole team over there, the strength of the United States is our private market. And when you combine a federal government initiative backing up private market, you get great results. Now, the question here again is it's going to shift beyond coronavirus. I think the lesson here and the lucky thing we had is we had a, a, um, a major pandemic, but one that didn't have what it could be, which is a really, really bad death rate. Mm. Uh, and so the question is, how do we prepare ourselves kind of going forward? And that's where I think you could think about an Operation Warp Speed Part 2, but something that makes sure that we're kind of future proofing so that we can really rush to fix things up front. You guys were both uh, critical in this Operation Warp Speed. And what I'm sort of 
confounded by is the fact that it's become so political instead of something that we should all be celebrating. I mean, this was something that was done in record time and has really, I guess, never been done. Why do you think and are you frustrated? Doctor, I'll start with you with the fact that this has become so political and it's Republicans primarily who have been hesitant, even though it's one of the accomplishments that uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, can really hang his hat on. Well, well, of course, and Adam's spoken about this issue uh, on this show before. Um, it's unfortunate that it's been politicized, but it was politicized before the election uh, with all the rhetoric about not trusting uh, Donald Trump's vaccine. And it was further politicalized, uh, politicized after the election uh, when uh, President Biden seemed to take all credit for Operation Warp Speed and said he was handed a mess. So we have to reboot, though. There should be nothing political about vaccines. These are highly safe. They're highly effective. Uh, the Trump administration developed them. Uh, the baton was handed to the Biden administration, and they're running with it. This is an American success story because of the government-private sector collaboration. Mm -hmm. Adam, you know, hit the nail on the head. That is the secret sauce. Why this happened, we have to learn from it and repeat it. Adam, the other thing about this is, as we, we know, the, the vaccine is a dead end for the virus. And the unvaccinated worldwide are allowing it essentially to mutate. It, it's become and probably will continue to be sort of a whack-a-mole until we get more global vaccinations, correct? Yeah, I think it is important. And, and I, I think Admiral Girard said it well. The president was one of the first people to be vaccinated. The president, when he got COVID, was one of the first people pushing forward uh, and using therapeutics, right? So this should be a bipartisan focus on vaccination. This is about health care. Um, and as I said, I, people can criticize uh, but at the end of the day, President Trump and, and every former president has been vaccinated. So it should be a Democrat, Republican, it, you know, united in this. I do think it's going to be important worldwide. Um, and, and so that's got to be a major focus. Yeah, Dr. Jawa, according to uh, a report from NBC News, six states now account for half of COVID hospitalizations. Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Indiana and New York. Not necessarily the states you might have expected or viewers might not have expected. Why do you think the, that is in those states? Well, this is a this is a tough pandemic. Uh, this virus is very contagious, particularly Delta. And I want to say it's fine for us to focus on Omicron, but Delta has got us now. Um, and what you see is uh, a regional pattern. We saw this from uh, the very earliest days in March that it may start somewhere, but then go somewhere else. I think you saw that it was in Texas and uh, and uh, Florida and some of the Gulf states. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody got blamed for that. There was no blame going on. It's a regional disease. Now it's up in the north uh, where you see it. So that regional pattern is typical. This will burn itself out in the north, mm -hmm. particularly as vaccines go up and natural immunity goes up. Uh, every day when people get infected, they do develop natural immunity, and that is a powerful protectant against future disease as well. A lot of developments today, a lot of good news as well, and two great voices to start us off. Adam Bowler, founding member of Operation Warp Speed. He now heads up Rubicon Founders, and also Dr. Brett Joie, former assistant secretary in the Human and Health, uh, Health and Human Services Department. Thanks to both of you. Appreciate it. Thank you. That, of course, the body cam footage showing former police officer Kim Potter shooting a suspect when she mistakenly grabbed her gun instead of her taser. Opening statements today in her manslaughter trial, we have an all-star panel to discuss whether an officer can go to jail for a deadly mistake and if Potter can get a fair trial in Minneapolis. That's ahead. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donald Report on Twitter. Another look at some of the body cam video of the deadly shooting of Dante Wright by a former police officer in April of this year. Opening statements began today in the trial of Kim Potter. She's facing first and second degree manslaughter charges after mistaking her gun for what she thought was her taser. Prosecutors argue Potter, who had a long history in law enforcement, should be held criminally liable for the 20 year old's death. She was the 26 year veteran. She was the officer in charge. And it was her job to show Officer Lucky how it's done. And what did she show him? She showed him how to kill someone. 
the language was direct, it was clear, it was unmistakable. And all Mr. Wright had to do was stop. He was told he was arrested on a warrant. He resisted, she said, I'll tase you. And all he had to do was surrender. Joining us now for this and uh, I guess more about the other trial that we're all following as well, that one, the Jesse Smollett trial here in Chicago, our criminal defense attorney Trent Copeland and criminal psychologist and columnist for front page detectives, Dr. Carol Lieberman. Trent, let's start with you. First and second degree manslaughter charges here. What's the difference and how does it come into play in this case? Well, you know, they're different um, and, and the variations, um, Joe, are not terribly substantial, but with respect to first degree manslaughter, it is if you engage in criminally reckless behavior, conduct that is so beyond the pale, conduct that is both reckless and criminally negligent, that it would cause a reasonable person to believe that you're engaging in conduct that is more likely to produce violent, dangerous um, uh, uh, problems, violent or dangerous consequences. And that's really what the distinction is from second degree manslaughter, which is a slightly less standard. It is you're not engaging in reckless conduct, but you are engaging in conduct that is likely to lead to the, to the, the death of someone. In, um, in this case, it was Dante Wright. Carol, you wrote that you don't think he can get a fair trial in Minnesota. Why is that? Absolutely. Um, this is in the shadow of the George Floyd trial. I think that the, uh, they should have tried to get a change of venue. Certainly there should have been uh, the jury sequestered. We should have learned that from the George Floyd trial. There is so much influence. There is so much intimidation by people, the same people who were intimidating uh, the same crowds outside the George Floyd courthouse. And, you know, and, and in this case, they've already tried, to, they have already intimidated some of the people involved, the people who were, um, you know, there was someone who quit because or resigned from this case because uh, they, they came, the protesters came to his house and so on. There were a number of people yeah. who they already intimidated. So I don't think that she um, is going, I think, you know, this is a, as a forensic psychiatrist and expert witness, I have been doing this for over 20 years, and I have seen this change uh, just recently, where the mobs, the, the people who are trying to intimidate the jurors, you know, we saw it obviously in George Floyd, we saw it in Kyle Rittenhouse, and now we're seeing it here. And we can't have a justice system where the juries are going to make decisions based upon fear of, based upon being intimidated and fear of what's going to happen to them. This was a concern, Trent, I guess, in, in Rittenhouse and also in the Ahmaud Arbery. These were both in small towns, right? But in the end, I think everyone felt like we uh, got the, the, the verdict that we maybe not expected, but was proper and should be respected. Right. I think that's right. And, and I'm going to disagree with, uh, with my, my old friend, Dr. Lieberman, who I've used in, in cases mm -hmm. before, and she's, uh, she certainly knows her stuff. But Carol, you're dead wrong here. Thank um, you. Either okay. the Ahmaud Arbery case or whether it was in the Rittenhouse case. Those jurors, I don't believe, were intimidated by what was happening outside of the courtroom. I think they followed the evidence that took place in the courtroom. And there's been no evidence here that in this case, in Kim Potter's trial, that there is going to be a substantial likelihood that these jurors are going to engage in jury nullification, not look at the evidence. It's clear. Look, and the reality is the most of these jurors are white jurors. These are jurors who come from the community. Our justice system has to work this way. It is designed so that people get a fair trial of people who are in their community, of people who are like them and around them. That is what our justice system is built on. It's a justice system where you receive a trial based on who your peers are. And we don't take these cases that's, that's... out of one county or out of one state to go to another state, particularly when we know that this is a case that is receiving national attention. It's not as if this case Kyle, is going to receive any less attention in Minneapolis than it is in, in, um, in, in Missouri. Well, because these cases I, are happening I, I, I all over to, the world. I They're happening to all over this country. No, I beg to differ with you. No, I beg to differ with you. The kind of um, emotion 
that was created for the George Floyd case in Minneapolis, that is something that is, is really more than, than we have seen and, and really has continued. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. And but I, Carol, are I you suggesting the that the emotion case, of the wait crowd... Wait, wait a minute. Yes, um, certainly um, we were, for Kyle Rittenhouse, I think that the jury did make the right decision. I didn't mean to imply that they didn't, but uh, it was amazing that they did, because in the courthouse, while they were deliberating, they were hearing the chants from the outside, no justice, no peace. Now, the Ahmad Aubrey case, I, I do think there was a problem with that. Um, but, you know, one of the things is the media really hasn't been covering the other side of this, which is, uh, well, first of all, the prosecutor and the defense agree on the fact that it was an accident. I mean, right. agree that, well, agree that she meant to take the, the taser. Right. So that isn't an issue. But, um, but, you know, one thing that I haven't see, really seen come out and that, you know, is a little one-sided is that... Um, uh, Dante Wright, uh, when they when he had a warrant and so on, he had there was a there's a case. You know there is a woman. He stayed over at a woman's house, uh, and then in the next in the morning he tried to strangle her to take her money. And there's another case where he Carol, is accused. Carol, 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 um, Carol. Let me interrupt here. I, I've, got, I've got to jump in here, Carol. You, you look, that's irrelevant. It's not a part of this evidence. Well, it had no, nothing not really. to do with what yeah. took place. It, what took place? No, Carol. You're doing exactly what the defense would no. like to do, and that is to put the victim on trial. <laughs> what he did outside of outside of the the the, the issues and the no, date I and think the it time is that when this when this took place no. has nothing to do. No, and what you're suggesting, Carol, is, is that he's a bad Trump guy. What you're suggesting. <laughs> Uh, Let me finish. What hey, you're suggesting, no, Carol, is that somehow they, they put, because he was either... Can I either get a had, word in here, Carol, please? let me finish a moment. Hang on. Let, let him finish, Doctor. You went on for a can while. I'll give you some time. In. Let me just jump in, Carol. Carol, you're going all over the place here. This has <laughs> nothing to that. do... Let, no, now, the wait jury, a second. Wait Carol, a minute. I really want to get a word in here. The jury has to make their decision based on... Carol, let me finish. Trent, Trent, let her go for a second. Go ahead, Doctor. Make your point. Thank you. <laughs> they put on Dante Wright's mother as the first witness. And of course, you know, that's a very emotional, I mean, she lost her son. It was very, of course it's sad and all of that. But, you know, the way they are portraying Kim Potter is totally one-sided. And you do need to know, I mean, you know why it's important to know about uh, Dante Wright's past history, his past issues, his violence past? It's because no, I don't. when you I don't try know to why judge... No, I don't know why important, because it's not well, important. Okay, well, if you'd, if you'd be quiet, I would, I would finish. <laughs> Because this, this contributes to why it was uh, the whole moment when she took out what she thought was her taser, when he was getting back into the car and she thought that he was going to drive away and, and her, her police um, colleague was going to be mm -hmm. killed. Um, it's important to know the mindset of Dante Wright. Okay, so doctor, let me let me pick it up from let me pick it up from there. Hang on, doctor. Let me let me that ask. That explains his mindset. Let me ask Trent a question to what I think you're bringing up here. First of all, Trent, is what happened and why the warrant was out there relevant in this case? Number one, and number two, to Potter's defense attorney's point, all he had to do was stop and not try to get away. Is that relevant in the case? Now, look, uh, Joe, let me address the, the last point first. Um, the whole idea of, you know, all he had to do was comply, all he had to do was stop, and no, none of this would have happened. Well, I suppose that has some bearing in reality, but he didn't comply, and he didn't stop. And what police officers have to do is to take into account the human frailties. He was afraid, but what these officers didn't think was that he was violent. What these officers didn't believe was that he possessed a weapon. What these officers didn't know was that he had no. a violent past because he didn't have a violent well, past. Well, he had the outstanding warrant, Trent. What, what, what was the yeah, outstanding warrant yes. for? He had an outstanding warrant, but that, do, that doesn't mean, Joe, it did that he say presents a gun. A, an On immediate the danger or threat to gun. these officers. Whether he had an out, people it have outstanding warrants no, for a variety was it, of reasons was it for all a, the time. Was it for a gun it, violation, Trent? But it it was for a gun violation, but there was that's no evidence that he had a gun in the car, Joe. There was no evidence, Carol, that he had a gun in the car, that he was intending she to was use one. In fact, the officer, in, oh, in fact, on. Officer Lucky testified that he had been compliant, yeah. that he was cooperative, and up until the moment where he tried to put handcuffs on him, 
was when he tried to run away. And look, the reality well, is we cannot put defendants on trial for things that took place mm -hmm. outside of what's happening under the, under the, the, the strict circumstances where they're arrested. Right. And by the way, Carol, whether or not yeah. his mind, whether or not Kim Potter knew that he had a that he had a warrant for his arrest may be may be material right. it may be but I don't think it's substantially material All right. but the fact is she didn't know anything else about him and that is what matters well listen Her state we're, of mind we're, is what's we're out of time both of you but this has been a fascinating conversation and I think a preview of what we can expect <laughs> in the jury room at some point attorney Trent Copeland and forensic okay. psychiatrist Dr. Carol Lieberman thank you both for your time Thank you. The video certainly tells the story in this case. Migrants crossing the border in Arizona illegally as the governor holds a news conference about migrants crossing the border illegally. You can't make this up. Former DHS chief Chad Wolf on that coming up. And a violent and disturbing scene in Chicago this weekend caught on camera. A bus driver dragged by a youth mob and beaten. What's happening in our cities and what do police do about it? Well, sometimes the video really does tell the story, and this time it's from our southern border. We're about to show you news footage straight from the Department of Irony. What you're seeing is a group of migrants, seven by our count, casually walking through a gap in the border wall and into Arizona from Mexico. They stop and just wait, wearing masks, some carrying duffel bags. Authorities are right there as they cross, as you see. So why is the camera rolling, you might wonder? Well, because they're entering the country as the governor of Arizona, Doug Ducey, is holding a news conference to address the recent migrant surge in Yuma. As the camera pans over to the governor, you can see he apparently has no idea what's going on behind him. The very surge he's talking about. Well, now, it's a lot more than seven people in the end, too. Here are the latest numbers from Border Report. 1,500 migrants crossing near Yuma on Monday alone, an estimated 4,000 tried to come through on Sunday. So you can hear Ducey speaking in the background as the migrants come in. Again, there's no indication he knows the seven migrants had just crossed illegally. That has people that uh, incursions right in the middle of the community, whereas the city of Yuma is one of the furthest away from the border. Uh, and so we don't get that activity in the city. So now Ducey is deploying the National Guard to help overwork Border Patrol officers as Arizona deals with what the governor is calling a surge. And as we said, the video certainly tells the story as this one did. Joining me now for more, former acting DHS secretary and Heritage Foundation visiting fellow Chad Wolf. Chad, it seems to me like this is kind of like holding a news conference about smash and grabs and then having a smash and grab happen right behind a police chief. Well, I think that's exactly right. And what you saw there were these illegal migrants coming across the border. They're not trying to abscond. They're not trying to get away from Border Patrol. In fact, it, it looked as though they're, uh, they're trying to find Border Patrol because they know if they turn themselves in, that in all likelihood they'll get released in somewhere between 12 and 24 hours later into the interior of the country, which is their end goal. Even though they have no legal right to, to remain here, that's what the Biden administration is doing. So uh, what you see there on camera happens thousands of times every single day along the border, not only in Yuma and in Arizona, but also in Texas and in California. It seems like some of them are younger. The unaccompanied minors would be allowed to stay, right? But the rest, I think, should be sent back, no? Well, it depends. I, again, I, I don't know the makeup of those individuals coming across that uh, border at that time. If they claim to be a family unit, if they claim to be all related and, and one happens to be a parent or a guardian of some kind, they will likely uh, be released into the country. You're right, though, if they are single adults, uh, they could get turned around, uh, but it's not 100 percent by any stretch. Here's the other thing that stood out to me, Chad, and you're looking at it as well. How is that section of wall just gone? I mean, can we not at least plug the obvious holes? Well, uh, I mean, that, that was part of the process uh, at the end of the Trump administration where we were building, um, you know, upwards to 450 miles of border wall system. And as contractors work on the wall, they work on it in pieces and they come together, uh, you know, to join that up. And when the Biden administration took over, as you know, they stopped all border wall construction. So there are gaps in the wall today, like you see on camera there, but there, there are others as well. And, uh, you know, just as we saw on camera, those are where the migrants are coming across. They don't want to deal with 
trying to uh, get over a, an effective border wall system. Instead, they're going to look for that gap or they're going to look for where it ends and simply cross in those areas. Well, speaking of that, we have seen the video of migrants doing just that. Uh, this was in Del Rio, Texas, as you know, where, where people were just streaming across the Rio Grande. And now here's video of that. Texas is lining up boats to stem the flow again. I'm sure there are people watching this chat and thinking, is there no barrier there or wall at all in that area? And if so, why not? Um, so there's not barrier right now. Obviously, we had plans to put barrier up there uh, in the Trump administration. There's a variety of different reasons. Most of the land in Texas is privately owned, such as uh, versus land in Arizona and other places, which is largely federally owned. So there are some differences there. But I think what it tells you is that Texas it has grown tired of the Biden administration not lifting a hand to try to secure their border and protect their communities. And so the governor is having to take actions into his own hands and expend considerable resources to do what the federal government should be doing. That's what they're designed to do is to protect that border and protect the sovereignty of the country. And they're not doing that uh, in the Rio Grande and along parts of Texas. I seem to ask you this, Chad, every time you're on, but what is Border Patrol supposed to do when you have 4,000 people crossing in Yuma on a Sunday? Well, you know, there's very little that they can do at that point in time. Um, this comes back to leadership of the department. This comes back to policies that have to be effective and the messaging has to be effective so that we send the signal that if you cross the border illegally, you're going to have a consequence to that action. And right now there's there's very little consequence to coming across the border illegally. And that's why Border Patrol will get overwhelmed. That's why they will have 4,000 in a given day or a weekend. It's not the, the men and women of the Border Patrol. It's not their fault. It's the, it's the fault of the leadership of the department, the administration, putting these policies in place, or I should say tearing down policies that encourage this illegal immigration without, or without any consequences. Mm -hmm. Well, Remain in Mexico has been reinstated, and uh, that was on Monday of this week. We'll see if that has any impact at all. Right. Chad Wolf, uh, acting, former acting DHS Secretary and Heritage Foundation Visiting Fellow, it's always good to have your insight on all this. Right. You've been in the chair. Appreciate it. Thank you. Up next, the latest in our ongoing series, the state of our cities, the action Chicago police are taking after violent and disturbing incidents like this one, a bus driver dragged and beaten. And did you see this? Someone lit the Christmas tree outside Fox News on fire. What in the world's happening in our city? That's next. Chaos again, striking Chicago's downtown loop. Here's some footage making the rounds on social media from over the weekend. 21 juveniles arrested, including a 15-year-old boy. who Police say beat a city bus driver. A group of young people, as you can see here, pulling the 49-year-old transit worker from the bus, beating and kicking him. Over that weekend, Chicago saw 36 shootings, several of them fatal. The bus driver was taken to the hospital. Now police in Chicago are being told no days off. WGN Chicago's Ben Bradley joins us now. This has been an ongoing problem, Ben, for quite some time. What do you think is behind it? Well, you've got the perfect storm of events, right? You've got a lot of kids deciding they're going to go downtown. You've got a lot of people not going downtown because of COVID and because they're not working down there. And then you have a lot of businesses that have been very fearful. And so all of that combines together to essentially have a problem that we used to see in the suburban malls. Many suburban malls now not allowing kids to go in there unsupervised. Well, now they're all hanging out downtown and some of them are turning violent. The problem is, what do you do about it, right? Because right? you can't say, what do hey, you do? groups of people, you can't come downtown. Right. So what are, what are police doing? Well, Chicago police have claimed that they have solved this problem several times, even going so far as to say in an extreme situation where they get intelligence that crowds are heading toward the Mag Mile, they would put up the bridges over the Chicago River and institute barricades uh, on Michigan Avenue. Right. They didn't put that place, that plan in place this past weekend. Uh, they are working with the merchants, though, giving private security, police radios, hoping that improves response time. They also want those private businesses to add more security themselves. The thing about this location, though, in particular, you could put the bridges up over the Chicago River, as you mentioned, but this has been contained, for the most part, to Michigan Avenue, mm -hmm. south of the river, in very popular areas. This is the Bean and Millennium Park. People who are familiar tourists to Chicago know this area well. It's very well attended by tourists. A couple of years ago, Chicago police got themselves into trouble when they saw gangs of kids hanging out downtown and converging on the downtown. Mm -hmm. What police did was essentially shut down the subway stations 
and order the trains to run express to the south side, essentially dumping all these people on the south side. That was not uh, viewed favorably. Uh, some called it racist, saying, oh, what, black kids can't come downtown, so you just put them on a train and bus them to the south side or train them to the south right. side? But it, uh, for now, anyway, no days off for police. Once again, and that's a huge issue for officers who've already had so many right. of their days off stripped. All right, WGN's Ben Bradley. Thanks for the time. Yep. Good to see you. Well, then there's this. Oh, Christmas tree. You know the song, right? Here's a variation of it. Oh, no. The Christmas tree is on fire. This is New York's Midtown. The 50-foot tree outside the Fox News headquarters set on fire. Police say a 49-year-old suspect climbed the metal superstructure of the tree and lit papers to start that fire. Then they say he climbed down and watched from street level as it burned. Retired NYPD Detective Tom Ruskin joins us now. Tom, this is your neck of the woods. This was a homeless guy, I understand, but uh, we've seen this in other cities as well. It happened here in Chicago, I think for the second year in a row, mm -hmm. a Christmas tree burned down, a menorah damaged as well. What, is, is nothing sacred anymore? Uh, it appears that that Christmas tree is no longer sacred, but, uh, it's not the first, as you allude to, Joe, it's not the first time that something like this has happened. When I was a cop, my first precinct was that area of Midtown Manhattan. And we used to have people occasionally try and click climb the barricades to get to the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, more to climb it than to do destruction. Mm -hmm. But in this case, you had a homeless guy who felt that he could burn down a Christmas tree. And this is a guy who has a long criminal record who should be in jail and is out on the streets. Right, he obviously right. had no fear of getting caught. He apparently just sat there and watched it burn. And they and it made it easy for police to not only come and catch him, but also for firefighters to put out the fire. Right, so uh, there are at least 12 major cities, Tom, that have broken all-time homicide records. Philadelphia's had more homicides this year than the nation's two largest cities, New York and LA. You saw what's happening here in Chicago, the segment before you. What, what is leading to all of this, do you think? I think it's politics. I think it's politicians scared to take a tough uh, stand on crime. If you don't take a tough stand on crime, as Bill de Blasio has it in New York City, you see crime rates going up. Crime rate in New York City has soared to record numbers over the years. Homicides are down just slightly, but the crime rate, and as Commissioner Shea today said in New York City, 30% of the people that they're arresting are out on other felony charges. It's time to put those people in jail, have them away trial, and not have them committing other major crimes in the meantime. We're seeing a lot of it, Tom. I mean, there were California robbers who were wearing police-type gear. I'm not if you, sure if you saw that during a home robbery at, at gunpoint. Yep. There was an L.A. detective who said, we're telling people don't visit because we can't keep you safe. And on top of this, I guess, police departments nationwide are facing the, the issue of resignations and retirements. I mean, some of the departments are down hundreds of officers. Yeah, New York City and other major cities are seeing all-time retirements because cops with 20 years do not want to have their ability to enforce the law taken away from them as has happened in major, major cities because of political actions. So cops are saying, forget, I have my 20 years, I have my 25 years, I'm going to retire. And as Detective McBride said mm -hmm. in L.A. in the last couple of days, the, the politicians have to allow the cops and the commanders to take back the streets from these lawless people, as you, you just saw in the Chicago video. Right. Well, I mean, people thought 2020 was bad. And as we mentioned, 12 of these cities that have broken all-time homicide records, five of those cities topped records that were set or tied last year. Just an example of what we're going through. Tom Ruskin, retired NYPD detective, now president of the CMP Protective and Investigative Group. Thanks for the time, Tom. Thanks, Joe. Have a good night. You too. On Balance with Leland Bitter starts at the top of the hour. He joins us now. And uh, we wanted to talk to you about this situation with the Olympics and whether to boycott and whether yeah. the diplomatic boycott is enough. And all of a sudden, Senator Romney chimes in with an interesting comment. Yeah, no, very interesting. And you have to think about how Beijing looked at the diplomatic boycott first, right? They said they were outraged and it's over, okay? Nobody's going to be talking about the fact that Joe Biden isn't in the stands uh, come February in Beijing. So diplomatic boycott means nothing. 
Romney said, oh, I want to hear the national anthem in Beijing, and you shouldn't penalize the athletes effectively for U.S. foreign policy. But it goes a little bit deeper than that, right? Really, the only way for the U.S. to send a message to Beijing in a meaningful way is for some kind of overreaction, if you will, in the same way that President Carter boycotted the Moscow Olympics in 1980. During every single moment in that, those games, the announcers had to say the Americans were boycotting. It meant U.S. sponsors had to pull out. That wouldn't be Coke, McDonald's, Nike, huge sponsorships that would have had to also boycott the game. So, uh, yeah, Romney sort of, in my opinion, kind of ducked on this one. And it's a very easy cop out to say, oh, we can't punish the athletes. Well, at some point, you've got to take a stand on right versus wrong. All right, much more at the top of the hour. You see, see you then. Balance. Thanks, Leland. <laughs> Keeping score tonight, and for the American worker, the post pandemic job market continues to be as needed. More than 4 million American workers quit their jobs in October. That's the second straight month. More than 4 million Americans quit when a record 4.3 million quit in September. Meantime, those seeking a new job, well, they're seeing a whole lot of four higher signs, more than 11 million of them. That's right, U.S. employers posted 11 million plus job openings in October, just below July's record number of openings. The 4.1 million quits in October, the third highest number dating back to the year 2000, for all you Conan fans out there. Now this. This is Pager. He's a nine-year-old macaque who had a Neuralink placed in each side of his brain about six weeks ago. If you look carefully, you can see that the fur on his head hasn't quite fully grown back yet. He's learned to interact with a computer for a tasty banana smoothie delivered through a straw. That is Pager the monkey using a chip implanted in his brain called Neuralink to play video games like Pong, that was eight months ago. Now Neuralink co-founder Elon Musk says the brain interface technology could be ready for human use as soon as next year. The chip intended to help people with serious spinal cord injuries and neurological disorders. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.